All right. Um, it looks like everyone's uh, people will start to filter in, uh, but we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Roman De Jesus. I'm a, a earth science professor here at Fullerton College. Um, and Dr. Ruben Lopez and I, I want to welcome you to the uh, Fullerton College Earth Day Symposium um, on fossil fuel divestment and climate action. Um, so today we're going to have two speakers. Um, we'll give them introductions uh, first, uh, but right now um, I'm going to go ahead um, and kind of give you the format. Um, so today's is a webinar format. If you have questions, um, we will go ahead and uh, you please use the Q&A um, 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 uh, uh, icon at the bottom to answer to ask questions for um, our speakers. Um, and at the end of today, um, our two speakers will give presentations about 30 minutes. And at the end, we will go ahead and field some of the Q&As um, for the audience. <clears throat> now, um, Ruben, would you like to go ahead and take it away? Sure. Again, welcome everybody uh, to our annual now 2022 Earth Day Symposium here at Bolton College. Uh, before we begin our program, we'd like to acknowledge let me share my screen very quickly. We like to acknowledge the land on who on uh, who we sit or where we sit, and it is customary now to acknowledge our uh, predecessors here on this land. Um, Fulton College is located on the unceded ancestral lands shared by the Gabrielino Tongva Nation and the Wanyanyo Band of Mission Indians, a Hashiman Nation who have been a traditional character, uh, traditional caretakers since time immemorial. From the water defenders stopping the building of the Keystone XL pipeline to the Warani uh, peoples protesting deforestation, the Peruvian Amazon, native communities across the globe continue to fight for and uh, fight for and protect the environment. And they have continued to pay a heavy toll. A report released by Global Witness last year um, counted 227 environmental activists killed in 2020, an undercount as this number relies on a level of transparency, freedom of press, and civil rights in individual countries. Indigenous communities make up only about 5% of the world's population, yet they bear the brunt of anti-activist violence and in last year's count, they suffered roughly a third of those activists killed fighting for the environment. In California, native communities are vital in helping to train firefighting agencies in more effective wildland firefighting techniques. Extremely important these days as climate change and drought is having more of an extensive hold on California and fires are becoming worse. Uh, moving away from fire suppression and using more traditional prescribed burns to protect California communities. We still have much to learn from their accumulated knowledge. And a quick background just on Earth Day, as we are in the 52nd anniversary of the original Earth Day, Earth Day began as a direct response to the fossil fuel industry damaging the California coast. On January 28, 1969, a massive oil spill occurred off the coast of Santa Barbara. Three to four million gallons of oil spread out over 35 miles, and it's still ranked as one of the worst oil spills in California history. The environmental movement existed before 1969, but it was fragmented and without a focused identity. Santa Barbara caught the focus of the nation and tapped into several societal energies swirling around environmental concerns, civil rights, and protests against Americans' involvement in Vietnam. 20 million Americans, 1,500 colleges and universities, and 10,000 schools participated in Earth Day 1970, focused more on activism rather than a celebration that is really associated with Earth Day today. Uh, this political wave in 1970 helped to create support for the creation of the EPA in 1970, the National Environmental Policy Act of 1970, the Clean Water Act of 1972, the creation of the California Coastal Commission in 1972, and the California Environmental Quality Act in 1970, among other pieces of important environmental legislation. Unfortunately, 52 years after Santa Barbara, 
Progress on some environmental issues, especially those related to climate change, seem to have stagnated. With that, let me invite Professor De Jesus to give an update on where we are currently in terms of climate change before introducing our keynote speakers. Um, thanks. So um, in 2015, um, 193, part, 193 parties of the United Nations Framework um, Convention on Climate Change ratified the Paris Agreement. Um, and this acknowledged that the, uh, each of these parties uh, uh, acknowledge the importance of limiting global climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius um, above average. Um, and so they reduced also uh, promise to reduce greenhouse emissions, uh, emissions with um, um, and uh, five-year commitments uh, um, renewed um, by the participating parties. Now, according to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, global warming reaching 1.5 degrees in the near term in the next couple few decades or so would cause unavoidable increases in cli multiple climate hazards and present uh, multiple risks to ecosystems and humans. Um, it, more importantly, if global warming um, exceeds 1.5 degrees Celsius in the coming decades, or even later, uh, many human and natural systems will face additional severe risks compared to remaining below that 1.5 degree threshold. So currently, um, our average global temperature is about one degree um, Celsius above the average uh, from 1850 to 1900 or pre-industrial uh, times. And we currently in the uh, atmosphere have about 420 ppm of atmospheric CO2 compared to about 300 before um, in during pre-industrial times. Now to put that into context, if no additional CO2 was added to the atmosphere, um, there would stand about a 15% chance that Earth's temperature would stabilize at 1.5 degrees Celsius or below. Uh, so this, um, so the amount of atmospheric CO2 currently um, clearly poses a problem, even if we were to stop all emissions now. Now, the IPCC in the past uh, year or so has released its um, um, regular report at the uh, AR6. Um, so this is the sixth report since the uh, uh, since the beginning of the um, UNFCCC in 1992, um, and they boldly stated that it is unequivocal um, that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land, and that widespread changes in the atmosphere, ocean, and biosphere have already occurred. Now, this uh, influence or this warming influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in the last 2,000 years and actually represents the warmest period in probably more than 100,000 years. So, as you can imagine, um, this warming is, uh, is, has not been seen by, mo by uh, human civilization at all. All right. So to give you a uh, couple of examples of some of the things that the uh, IPCC has also written about kind of uh, the, in the impacts um, and some of the mitigation strategies um, more recently, uh, the working groups have re uh, released their reports in both February and earlier this month. And they include that um, they conclude that more frequent and, inten and intense extreme weather events um, can cause large impacts and related to, um, uh, to nature and human society. Um, and this is all beyond the natural climate variability. So there, this requires some development and adaptation efforts to occur. Now, the vulnerability of people to climate change differs substantially both within different regions um, as well as globally. And a large part of this, as we might hear today, is driven by patterns of socioeconomic development, um, different land and ocean use, um, historical and ongoing patterns of inequity, such as colonialism and different types of government. Um, and this includes about three and a half billion people who are at risk um, to, um, to climate change. So this is a about the, half the world's population um, is vulnerable in this way. All right. And so if, um, or excuse me, um, so the uh, IPCC has also uh, provided some guiding models uh, for put potentially how to mitigate or um, reduce the impacts of climate change. And one of the models states that uh, if we were to peak greenhouse gas emissions um, between now and 2025, uh, we would certainly be able to limit global warming um, or the warming to less than 1 to 1.5 degrees Celsius with very little chance that we would go over that. 
Um, but however, this assumes that immediate action has uh, will be taken uh, by local and uh, regional governments uh, to eliminate greenhouse gases. And that so far has not been the case. And so that means without strengthening any of these uh, policies uh, by the end of uh, per per perhaps by mid decade, greenhouse gases are uh, projected to, uh, to continue to rise beyond um, 2025 um, and potentially leading to a warming of at least three degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Now that three degrees Celsius is twice our, the limit agreed to in the Paris Agreement um, and could cause potentially catastrophic um, impacts on both natural systems as well as different human and social systems. Um, other strategies include, uh, other than reducing greenhouse gases, um, is, remove, uh, is uh, transitioning away from fossil fuels, um, carbon capture and sequestration um, um, strategies, that uh, is removing CO2 as it comes out of a um, out of the uh, tailpipes or even smokestacks, um, and actually removing uh, carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere. However, these technologies are still not uh, where we want them to be, um, and therefore are very likely to play a very small role in the near term. And so one of the other things that the IPCC highlighted is that the continued installation of fossil fuel infrastructure will essentially lock in future greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so therefore, if we were to uh, hit peak greenhouse gas emissions and then lower them, uh, we need to uh, basically uh, uh, significantly uh, stop our fossil fuel infrastructure building um, and instead transition into alternative types of energy. All right, so that uh, gives us a good segue into um, kind of why fossil fuels, um, uh, the, the role that fossil fuels play in our, um, uh, not just in our economy, uh, but also in our energy sectors. And so uh, the two speakers today will focus on what fossil fuel divestment means um, and how that will contribute to climate action. All right, um, so our first speaker, um, uh, Antonio Juez um, is a leading energy and climate author and investigative journalist. An award-winning writer by her bylines include Rolling Stone, Harper's Magazine, Newsweek, The New York Times, The LA Times, The Atlantic, CNN.com, The Nation, um, The Advocate, The Guardian, and many more. Antonio is the author of three books, Black Tide, The Tyranny of Oil, and The Bush Agenda. And so she's going to be our first speaker. Um, and so we'll give Antonia uh, 30 minutes. Um, and then our second speaker, Tom Sanzillo, is the Director of Finance for the Institute of Energy, Economics, and Financial Analysis. He is the author of several studies on coal plants, rate impacts, and credit analyses, and the public and pri private financial structures for the energy industry. So um, when, when Antonia is done, we'll transition to Tom. Um, and at this point, Antonia, I, um, I'll leave it to you. Well, thank you so much, um, Roman and Ruben, for that excellent uh, introduction. And Tom, great to see you. Looking forward to your talk. And thank you to Fullerton um, for having us both today. It's really an incredible moment in history to be having this critical conversation. And I'm thrilled to spend this Earth Day with you and everyone joining us today. So thank you for being with us. Um, as was touched on in my introduction, to a large degree, I've spent the bulk of my career researching, writing, and reporting from the communities on the front lines of fossil fuels and the climate crisis. And I currently teach a course at Tulane uh, University in New Orleans, where I am, called Fossil Fuels and the Climate Crisis. Um, mm. I've traveled from Afghanistan to the Ecuadorian Amazon, from the tip of the Alaskan Arctic to the bottom of the ocean in the Alvin submarine at the site of the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster. I've been on oil soaked beaches across the Gulf and across California to France covering the signing of the Paris Climate Accord to the protests led by water protectors against the Dakota Access oil pipeline, which you saw. I've covered the Waarani, which you also saw in the introduction, um, and many, many other places in between uh, covering this story. Yet in preparing for this talk, um, it was really my more formative years that have been dominating my thoughts. 
And that's from when I was in high school in the 1980s in Boulder, Colorado. And I had two main extracurricular activities. The first was working on the student newspaper. And the second was as founder of the Amnesty International chapter at our school. Both of these led me to join the effort <clears throat> underway at the time, trying to push the University of Colorado, uh, which was just up the hill from our school, to divest from any businesses supporting the South African apartheid regime. It was a profoundly successful global movement and incredibly um, monumental in my life to have been a part of. It not only undermined the, um, the apartheid regime's financial support, but also any semblance of moral legitimacy to those who continue to support it. I've been thinking a lot about that today. I've also been thinking about another anniversary that takes place today, not just the Earth Day anniversary, but also that of the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster. It's the worst offshore drilling oil spill in history. It took place just miles from where I'm sitting right now. And it's an ongoing crisis that I've been reporting on for over a decade and about which I wrote a book called Black Tide, The Devastating Impact of the Gulf Oil Spill. It's shaped a great deal of my understanding of the fossil fuel industry and also those communities impacted by it. I think most importantly, as I've studied uh, the ongoing impacts of the disaster and have been in some ways embedded within these communities uh, for so long, this is also one of the areas that's one of the birthplaces of the fossil fuel industry. And what I've learned is that for as long as there has been an industry, there have been communities on the front lines who have been resisting it, offering alternatives to it, and often living and engaging in those sustainable solutions to it. But very often these are marginalized communities, marginalized in a number of ways, and their ideas, their, the effects, their um, uh, suggestions, their studies, their offerings have often been ignored and mar marginalized as well. One of the things that's changing, I think right now in, a, in the climate crisis, in the climate movement and addressing the climate crisis is a much greater appreciation and growing appreciation of the knowledge and necessity of fronting those frontline communities. And even in the re recent um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, which was uh, mentioned in our introduction, it highlighted that we cannot confront the climate crisis without putting that experience and expertise of frontline communities in the forefront in coming up with understanding the impacts of the crisis, but most importantly, those solutions, those solutions that they've been working on uh, and living for at least 150 years since the fossil fuel uh, industry began, but much, much lo longer than that um, with indigenous and frontline communities um, thriving well before the fossil fuel industry uh, came along. So it's within that context that I wanna speak with you uh, about why on Earth Day, the conversation that we're having in confronting the climate crisis is a conversation that centers on fossil fuels and the fossil fuel industry, and why divestment from fossil fuels has come to play such a key role in the climate movement. Um, and really, Tom is the one who's gonna center in on the divestment conversation. I'm gonna sort of set the stage for him in talking about fossil fuels. Um, but as I said, in my career, I keep track quite a bit and report on what communities are doing um, in addressing fossil fuels. So I actually thought I would start us off um, by sharing a clip that I saw this morning. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen. I think that should be all set up for me to do that. Um, right here from Twitter, with an action that was taking place uh, with a protest at a city bank in New York. And the protest is targeting Citibank's financial support of the fossil fuel industry for fueling the climate crisis. So they are um, blockading the inside of the Citibank in this protest.
So that shows us the timeliness of, of what we're talking about, uh, right there this morning. And then I'm going to go into my presentation, um, which, uh, let's see, is it going to show, I want to see myself. That's right. You can see that I'm talking. Um, hopefully that if someone can let me know if that looks good, uh, on the screen right now. Yeah, you're okay. Okay, great. And our, sorry, just so I can see, are you seeing my slide or are you also seeing our images superimposed on top of it? Uh, we, depending on how people have their uh, video set up or their screen set up, but I can see both you and the, um, our, the newspaper front page. Wonderful, thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, so um, I start, I'm taking us back to the eighties again. I like to start off with this New York Times um, uh, article, cover article which is from June, 1988, New York Times, lays out the problem. The problem is global warming, lays out uh, what action needs to be taken. And that's a sharp cut in burning of fossil fuels. Pretty straightforward, pretty much where we still are today. Um, okay, it's not letting me move forward. Okay, um, so why do we talk about fossil fuels? And I think just this just often needs to be restated um, that fossil fuels are the primary source of greenhouse gas emissions. Emissions of several important greenhouse gases that result from human activity have increased substantially since large scale industrialization began in the mid 1800s. Most of these human caused anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions were carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels. The imbalance between greenhouse gas emissions and the ability for natural processes to absorb those emissions has resulted in a continued increase in atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases, which result in global warming. Fossil fuels are the largest source of, of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions in the world. The fossil fuel industry and its products accounted for 91% of global industrial greenhouse gases in 2015 and 70% of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. These are the other emissions. And it's important to look at these because, so the primary source is greenhouse gas emissions, uh, sorry, the primary source is fossil fuels and the burning of fossil fuel, fuels. These are the others, but almost all of the others also involve fossil fuels. So there's methane, which of course, I hope we all increasingly know uh, one of the largest sources of which is oil and natural gas operations. And that methane is now being recognized as uh, incredibly important for us to tackle in addressing the climate crisis. Um, that methane emissions can be, depending on what scale you're looking at, 20 to 80 times more um, harmful to the climate uh, than is even CO2. But also looking at nitri nitrous oxide, one of the other sources is burning of fossil fuels, that basically when we're looking at all of these emissions that are destroying our climate, fossil fuels uh, are found at the heart of almost every single one. And that in 2019, fossil fuels were the source of 80% of US, U.S. primary energy consumption, 94% of total U.S. carbon dioxide emissions, and 80% of total U U U.S. greenhouse gas emissions resulting from human activity. <clears throat> For this reason, the International Energy Agency, when it set out its net zero by 2020 report, the two, the three front and center items for 2020 is the first one. And then 2021, where the second two, um, no new sales of fossil fuel boilers, but we won't go into that. But the two that we're going to focus on, no new uh, unabated coal plants and no new oil and gas fields approved for development, no new coal mines or mine extensions. And the central focus of this finding, uh, which they then elaborate on in their report, is that there should be no new investments in fossil fuel operations moving forward. And this is to get to their timeline. Basically, you cannot make progress on getting to net zero without starting by halting new investments in fossil fuel operations. And then just to center us in the differential impacts um, that both Roman and Ruben addressed. And I think it's important just to say this at the outset when we're talking about solutions, 
um, and reminding us what environmental and climate justice means. So environmental and climate justice are addressing environmental racism and climate racism. And the point is without racism, societies would be unable or less able to offload <clears throat> environmental and climate costs to others. Those activities, oil production, polluting operations, et cetera, would not take place or at least they'd be better regulated and there would be no climate crisis or greater action would be taken to make necessary changes to confront it. So that addressing racism is key to solving the climate crisis and confronting environmental and cl climate racism and injustice is central to how we confront the climate crisis. Now this, we are building on um, responses. So the International Energy Agency um, report, which says no new investments in new oil and gas or coal operations, and the IPCC findings that Roman and Ruben addressed is getting to this idea that there can that oil and gas and coal essentially need to, or are going to end up being kept in the ground. And that's building off of these local resistance movements that I've talked about that have been making this same uh, demand for some time. These are protests um, in Ecuador. These are photographs that I've taken from San Francisco to New York. This is Paris. This is San Francisco. This is New York. This is the New York uh, People's Climate March. That this is a, a long-term, long-going um, demand that movements have made. And then this is also reflected in um, the finance sector. So this is a quote from Sarah Bloom Raskin, the former Federal Reserve Governor and former Deputy Secretary of the US Treasury. Even in the short term, fossil fuels are a terrible investment. It also forestalls the inevitable decline of an industry that can no longer sustain itself. And she's also responding in this uh, statement to, again, findings from international agencies saying we basically cannot confront the climate crisis if we keep uh, investing in fossil fuels. So she's saying, you know, this is just a bad, a bad deal to keep, keep going in. <clears throat> but then there's the effect on uh, human rights and the effect of the climate crisis on human rights. And I think this is a very important um, space to talk about when we're talking about divestment, because the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, report on climate change and poverty by the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights back in 2019, and these findings have been reiterated each year, found that addressing climate change will require a fundamental shift in the global economy, decoupling improvements in economic well-being from fossil fuel emissions. Essentially to move forward on the rights granted for human rights, you have to move away from fossil fuels. And then, particularly when we're talking about divestment, it's important to look at the findings because the, these findings, because the industry has um, found a lot of success in putting the problem of fossil fuel consumption on consumers and trying to shift away from uh, responsibility to itself. And this report um, found that since 1988, more than half of all global industrial greenhouse gas emissions can be traced to just 25 fossil fuel companies. And these are the 25. So you can actually trace where the emissions are, are coming from and who's doing them. And so you can look at each individual company on this list and see what their individual contribution has been to the climate crisis. And as this again says, more than half can all be um, put on these relative handful of companies. And this uh, information, which if I was looking at my presenter view, I could cite the report from you and I'll share it if anyone wants to know, it's in my notes in the presenter view. Um, this information has been used in a lot of really important ways including a very important recent court ruling that again is important within this context of divestment. What's the role of individual companies and the idea of financially continuing to support them? So in this uh, ruling just last year, a Hague district court found in um, Mille Defense et al. the Royal Dutch Shell, one of the basis of its, of its court finding 
was that uh, research that I showed before. And the court essentially found that Dutch law upholds the right to basic guaranteed human rights. And it found that Shell, Shell Oil Company, violated these rights due to its fossil fuel operations. And the reason why is because those operations are worsening climate change and worsening climate change harms many fundamental human rights. And the court ordered Shell to reduce its CO2 emissions by 45% by 2030. And it said that basically that's going to most likely require that it um, shift away from those fundamental operations of burning fossil fuels. And uh, I reported on this for Rolling Stone and Michael Berger, executive director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia University said to me of the court's ruling, this is the first time that a court of law has drawn a clear connection between a fossil fuel company's basic business model, the production and sale of fossil fuels, and the threat to human rights that results from climate change impacts, and then directed the company to do something about it. Really importantly within these findings is that the court lays out how Shell knew, and this is reflecting on something that there's been, I think, more coverage of with, re with respect to Exxon. And I'm going to talk about Exxon actually really quickly, even though you're looking at this slide about Shell, which is that back in the 70s and 80s, Exxon and Shell were conducting research, which uh, demonstrated to them that the burning of fossil fuels would alter the climate and that it would do so in a way that was harmful. And then the companies then responded in different ways to that information. Exxon, again, of which there's been a lot of attention, uh, very specifically took that information, decided not to share it with the public, and instead, and instead became a very aggressive funder of the climate denialist movement, uh, making putting forward public statements itself, questioning the reality of climate change, but then funding other groups that very directly said, climate change isn't a problem um, and there's we don't need to do anything about it. And Exxon, uh, through a lot of investigations of Exxon, it's been demonstrated that Exxon's concern was that it didn't want regulation. It didn't want to be regulated to have to rein in those fossil fuel operations. And so it funded this denialist movement. And many of us believe that that funding uh, as long with other companies and groups like the American Petroleum Institute put us probably back decades in trying to confront climate change because so many in the public believed this, mis this misinformation. They felt, and the media uh, had a huge role in this, that there had to be, that there was this sense that there was a debate among scientists that maybe climate change is real, maybe it's not. And so the media felt like it had to present both sides uh, of an argument that we have since learned was not there, was never there, that the scientific consensus had always held that the burning of fossil fuels causes climate change to great harm. And in fact, both Exxon and Shell and other companies were aware of that as well. But that lack of public certainty reduced public pressure on policymakers to put in place regulations, which was exactly the end goal that uh, the companies had hoped. And in this court ruling, the, uh, the court actually looks at Shell, what Shell knew when, and then finds, again, this is more evidence that they knew um, about the harms of uh, fossil fuels and the impact on climate change, that they were aware of it. But then that they, the court basically finds that Shell simultaneously increased statements to the public and shareholders acknowledging the recognition of the dangers of its products, different from Exxon in this case, pledged investments in renewables and reductions in emissions, but instead, essentially while simultaneously, it invested aggressively in operations which dramatically increased its fossil fuel operations and greenhouse gas emissions. So the court basically found that um, Shell's policy and uh, intentions and ambitions largely, sorry, that the court, sorry, Shell's stated intent that it has um, invested in renewable energy, did invest in renewable energy, will continue to do that. The court found that these amounted to intangible, undefined, and non-binding plans, and that therefore the court 
was required, and the, the court found that Shell's um, policies and operations run contrary to the rights guaranteed to the citizens of the Netherlands, uh, which Shell has acknowledged and is obligated to uphold, and that Shell therefore um, was being required by the court to cut its emissions almost by half by 2030. And this finding is incredibly important because the court also says that Shell isn't alone, that other oil companies are likely going to need to be uh, held to account as well. But the fact that Shell isn't alone doesn't absolve Shell from its legal obligation. And it's also important because the company, the court is also calling out Shell and saying, even though you've stated that you understand this crisis, and even though you've stated that you're going to invest in renewables, you're not doing it. And the only way to make you change your policies is we're going to have to order you to do so. And by the way, Shell is, um, uh, is challenging this, this, this ruling. But it's also had an effect. Immediately after this ruling, Shell has started to divest from fossil fuel operations, um, noting that that, that was the, um, the necessary judgment that it can't be invested in fossil fuels. And so I want to just bring this right to where we are right now in the public conversation about the role of fossil fuels uh, in the current crisis in Ukraine. Um, so this was a protest that was held in Germany. Um, it is uh, for Ukraine and calling on the end of fossil fuels as a way of stopping the war. And immediately after the war began, we started to see a really important focus on what it means to still be dependent on fossil fuels at the time of war. And so Svetlana um, Kraskokova, Ukraine's representative to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, said this, human-induced climate change and the war in Ukraine have the same roots, fossil fuels, and our dependence on them. This was a protest by a Ukrainian um, that where he basically was evacuating from Kyiv and he was still participating in the climate strike, the Friday climate strikes at the same time. And this was a post that he put on Twitter. He said, I was fighting against cl climate crisis. Now I'm fleeing a war caused by fossil fuels. Um, and then this is United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez speaking about the Ukraine war. And he said, as current events make all too clear, our continued reliance on fossil fuels makes the global economy and energy security vulnerable to geopolitical shocks and crises. Now is the time to accelerate the energy transition. And President Biden, the US must transition to clean energy That'll mean tyrants like Putin won't be able to use fossil fuels as weapons against other nations. And editorial boards across the world, this is the Financial Times, said that Europe must end its Russian energy habit. War in Ukraine has strengthened the case for alternatives to fossil fuels. The Los Angeles Times is on the right and their editorial said, uh, what's better than a ban on Russian oil imports? Ending our dependence on fossil fuels. And this is where I'm wrapping up, which is uh, my latest article, which is in Zeke magazine. And what this looks at is sustainable solutions to the climate crisis. And it takes us back to where I began, which is that communities on the front lines of fossil fuels and the climate crisis have long been offering um, solutions. And those solutions are focused on moving away from large centralized forms of energy uh, that are held and controlled by fossil fuel companies. They repeatedly tell me um, in interviews that I've conducted all over the world that they've seen what the fossil fuel companies have done when they've known about the crisis, when they've promised to shift to fossil fuels, when they've controlled energy, and they don't like what they've experienced or what they've seen. And then instead, the solution is moving to renewable sources of energy, but those that are localized, communally owned, 
controlled by a local community, produced in a local community, shared by a local community, where you reduce the overall amount of energy that you're using because the energy source is so close to you, and you remove that power and control over it, that that control of fossil fuels gives to countries, gives to companies, and you remove that power element by localizing, distributing, communally own, owning sources of energy and removing the companies essentially from the equation altogether. And divestment is certainly one of those strategies that communities have advocated for over and over again, which is to say, let's not put our money behind supporting these companies. Let's not put our money behind in supporting fossil fuels. Let's instead divest and redirect that money at supporting and funding those local communities that are now and have been struggling to input, to, to um, create and implement those sustainable alternatives. So I will stop there and thank you all so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Antonia. Um, I have so many questions, but I'm gonna go ahead and <laughs> save some of those for our Q&A. Um, I wanna remind, her, I wanna remind the attendees that you do have the Q&A option. Uh, you can type in the question um, and if we can, we'll get to them. Otherwise we will also answer them um, at the end of Tom's um, um, session. Um, so uh, thank you again. And it's all, uh, you know, I'm, I was surprised to hear that your activism started with the divestment of the South African apartheid. I really want to uh, uh, kind of come back to that a little bit later, but thanks. Um, Ruben? Um, I can't remember, are we doing the questions now or at the end of Tom? Well, in the interest of time, I think uh, we should go ahead and move to Tom. I agree, yep. I agree. Yep. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and then introduce Mr. Tom Sanzillo. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, let's lost my. So, Tom Sanzillo is the director of finance for the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. He is the author of several studies on coal plants, rate impacts, credit analyses, and public and private financial structures for the energy industry. Uh, please give a warm welcome and please pay attention to what Mr. Sanzillo has to say. He's going to get the nuts and bolts of divestment. Go ahead, Tom. Well, th thank you, Ruben. Um, and um, <clears throat> I wanna thank Antonia for that presentation. Um, um, it, you were very modest in your presentation of your work. Antonia is, we don't talk much about this in the United States anymore, but we have public intellectuals. And Antonia is probably one of the most important um, the public intellectuals that we have. And that presentation that you just witnessed is probably the best presentation I've ever seen on the climate. And you should be, take notes, because um, this one isn't gonna be as good. Um, anyway, um, I work for an organization called the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Um, we're in about 30 countries. And what we try to do in a practical matter is to support the fights that Antonio was talking about. And we do it with money and finance and um, energy economics. And we do it because we're, you know, we're experts and can um, make the case back to the oil and gas industry and the bankers and the uh, financial infrastructure that is propping it up. Um, I too wanted to start a while ago because gray hair is gray hair. Um, and in the, in the early 70s, I was a participant in those um, Earth Day celebrations. And it had a really important impact on me. And I want to just talk about it for a minute. I was a young activist and was involved in anti-Vietnam War actions, um, voter mobilizations. Um, housing rights and poverty and abortion rights. And it was largely organizing in what I would say was the dark side of humanity, um, injustice and war. And I would lived in a neighborhood. I was the uh, first in my family to be educated. And I lived in a neighborhood in Brooklyn that was being ripped apart by racial 
uh, uh, violence. And I got to the point where I didn't know if I could continue. And I um, went to the first Earth Day celebration. I think it was the first or the second, I can't remember, but I was pretty young. And I, what I saw there that day was people talking about, you know, clean air and clean water and green spaces and health. And that's I'm like, you know, that was not my political experience. It was on a much more difficult set of things. And I kind of came away there saying, this is what I need. If there are, um, if there were forces that were pulling me to this sort of dark side of humanity, these people here were my um, kindred spirits looking for um, a better way. And so I decided that that was what I was gonna be doing. And that was the Earth Day. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about later, um, but in my life, I gravitated to money and politics. And um, the question I've always had in the back of my mind is, you know, how can, how can all this money in the world be actually used for some good? Um, and I believe that it can be. Um, and so I keep pushing at it. Recently, um, <clears throat> the head of one of the most important investment houses in the world, um, BlackRock, um, he, he said, um, we focus on sustainability because we're environmentalists, not because we're environmentalists, but because we are capitalists and fiduciaries to our clients. Um, when I first started doing this work about, I don't know, 13 or 14 years ago, before that I was involved with money and uh, finance. Um, and um, until very recently, it was believed that the kind of investments we're talking about hurt profits. What Larry Fink from BlackRock is saying now is that the sustainable investments that Antonio was just talking about actually improves profits. And that is um, earth shattering um, in terms of the perspective of the financial industry. But it's just some, and sometimes it's just superficial. Um, and it's up to us to turn it into something real. Um, so when, when I, when I uh, was asked to come um, talk today, I was thinking more about and most uh, besides going back to Earth Day, I, I was, I've been thinking about what's been happening in the last number of years because it's, um, it's um, the war that I'm involved in every day. Um, the climate movement's been asking governments and pension funds and insurance companies, endowments and foundations um, and a host of corporations and institutions to pull out of fossil fuels. And these investment funds control trillions of dollars that provide money to every aspect of the economy, not just fossil fuels, but the pharmaceutical industry, the information technology industry, utilities, and the energy sector. And the energy sector is largely oil and gas and coal interests. So while at times it seems like these big investment funds, like they really have no relationship to um, to um, oil and gas, actually they own them. And all of these funds own these companies through shares, uh, stock, bonds, and other kinds of investments. And Antonia gave us very good political and moral arguments and why universities and pension funds and others should, um, should, should be divesting. And my goal here is to talk to you about why this makes sense from a money position, straight up money, um, profits, and what, how the economy is going to be growing. Um, what I can say is that over the past few years, more funds, investment funds, and more big funds are moving away from fossil fuels it's a trend worth um, understanding. It's particularly worth understanding in California. Last night, I attended a, uh, a hearing in Sacramento um, debating a divestment bill. Your um, major pension funds in the, in the state are saying they don't feel that they should be moving towards divestment. And there are a very large group of people in the state who feel otherwise, including hundreds of students who got on the phones last night to um, voice their opinions um, 
And I felt I, I was a former fund manager, just like the ones who are the opposing um, of divestment here. And um, I spoke in favor of the bill um, to force them to divest. And as a former fund manager, I kind of felt a little bit um, sympathy for the, um, for the pension fund uh, people um, because they actually know what they should be doing um, and they're not doing it. And they should be divesting because it is sound investment strategy in 2022. Um, so when thinking about why a pension fund or an endowment should divest from oil and gas stocks, you have to start with, with preconceptions and facts about um, the industry. And um, we have a view um, in this country that environmental um, protection and profits are in conflict. And if you hold that view, then if you divest from fossil fuels, you are essentially going to be harming your um, investment returns and your investment portfolio. The truth is that the environment and profit making um, don't have to be in conflict. They often are, and, and they don't have to be in conflict in the way they're in conflict. Um, I, just, I have just a couple of slides and I'm gonna put one up. Um, Let's see if I can do this. What happened to it? Mm -hmm. It's here just a minute ago. Okay, is that, can you see that? Okay. Um, yeah, can you yep. see it now? Yeah, okay. that's good. Okay, um, and I'll just do this one. Anyway, um, so when it comes to divesting oil and ga gas stocks, we, we got, you, what you find is that you'll be protecting the environment and you're also going to be improving investment portfolios and you may even produce higher returns. Now, I was involved in investing money um, for the governments of the city and state of New York for about 17 years. Um, and I want to consider, I have one slide and I'm just going to leave it here for a while. And then I have a, a little one that after this, um, this is the one substantive slide. In 1980, oil and gas stocks were 28% of the Standard & Poor's 500. That's 28% of the economy. That's like what Amazon and Google and all of those companies are, um, the, the uh, information technology um, companies are today. That was oil and gas in the 1980s. Um, they were a major contributor to financial um, markets in the world um, and to the funds that I managed. Um, today, that line going all the way down, they are 3.7% of the, of, the, um, of the stock market. That's, um, you know, um, you could argue anything you want to, but in my book, that's less, considerably less. Um, and they lost market share because it's simple, they're less profitable. And if you think about it, this means that investors are increasingly choosing stocks from other parts of the economy and not fossil fuels. So over the last 10 years or so, when you look at, there have been new kinds of investments which are fossil free investments. And over the last 10 years, those fossil free investments made more money than the fossil free investments with oil and gas companies. These are called indexes and the indexes are groupings of stocks that are combined around a market theme or a strategy. And the largest funds try to capture the value of the entire economy because over the long run, the economy usually grows. So you try to have everything in there, including fossil fuels. But what we've noticed over the last 10 years as this downward trend is occurring is that fossil fuels have actually driven down the overall profitability of the world economy. That's what happens when you're that big and you collapse. So they have been lagging the world economy and pulling down the rest of the, um, the market. Now, <clears throat> this isn't just me who sees this. Uh, the government of Norway is a very interesting and clear case 
for um, why we have need to move um, from, from fossil fuels. Um, its economy is heavily dependent on oil and gas revenues. 25% of all government revenues and about 30% of the economy is from oil and gas. They own oil and gas. They, they drill for it, they buy it, I'm sorry, they sell it. Um, and that, that their annual revenues are what closes their budget deficits and makes it possible for them to have a, a, a an enormous surplus for the, from 1990 till about 2015. And that enormous surplus turned into a $1 trillion um, um, a fund, which they are now going to be using because since 2016, they have been publishing a chart. And that chart is showing that they will no longer be receiving oil and gas revenues sufficient to cover their deficit. They will no longer be receiving oil and gas revenues sufficient to build their fund anymore. They in fact have to draw from the fund and they don't see this changing until 2050 because in 2050, they don't think they're gonna have anything left at all. That is a view from a country and um, that is dependent on fossil fuels. Its advisors are the best uh, advisors in the world on fossil fuels, or there might be um, some that are equal too, but there will be none better. I've uh, advised the fund um, there. Um, and they know they have to come up with a new economy. Now these investments, this view um, is also true of Russia and Saudi Arabia, but Russia and Saudi Arabia are not transparent and they don't, tell their public what is going on and they do other things in order to deal with it. Like today, the events in Ukraine show us perhaps the ugliest side of oil and gas. Um, President Putin, Russia's leader, started a war in the Ukraine to recapture part of uh, Russia that he feels was lost. Um, his actions have also raised the price of oil to um, historically high levels. And um, oil is, in, is the most important source of money for Russia, even more important for Russia than it is for, um, for Norway. And Ukraine gives him control of major pipelines into Europe. And that's something that he now pays for and doesn't want to pay for anymore but it also is doing something else. High oil prices are also how oil and gas companies like Exxon and Shell and other nations like Saudi Arabia make money. Right now, war and bloodshed is driving prices up where markets have been failing to do so for a decade. It is these kind of geopolitical actions that are going to be the way in which the fossil fuel industry organizes itself, because as I've trying to been trying to say, it has no financial rationale anymore. So it's going to be about raw politics, and these facts tell us that the oil and gas stocks, once major contributors to world finance, are now incredibly shaky. BlackRock, the same firm I just talked about, performed a study for the city of New York. Its pension system asked BlackRock if they could divest from fossil fuels and still maintain their financial targets. They have retirees to take care of. Um, the, the, one of the funds that, that I was involved, I was a manager of for many years. Black, BlackRock's answer to them was, yes, you can divest and yes, you can meet your financial targets. BlackRock is opposed to divestment as a policy they are um, uh, serving their clients who ask them about divestment. They tell them the truth and they tell them, yeah, you can do this. In fact, when they did their analysis, they found out that of the many uh, uh, funds that had divested, that none of them did worse financially. All, most of them did better and some were neutral. Um, but no one, no, none of them lost money from getting out of fossil fuels. And of course, with a record like the, one, the screen I'm showing you, where they're just losing year after year after year, it's not a surprise that those were the findings. Those who argue that a fund will lose money, therefore, 
which are most of our oil and gas industry, are absolutely wrong. Oil and gas stocks have collapsed over time despite the current high oil and rising stock prices. In fact, right now with the high oil prices, if I was still a fund administrator considering divestment, now's the time I would divest because you're gonna make a lot of money doing it. Um, and funds that have, have seen um, so-called losses from prior divestments like South Africa and tobacco, this was raised by the CalPERS and CalSTRS um, pension funds in your legislature yesterday. They are wrong about that. Um, they are wrong because the fund managers themselves um, have uh, were able to um, continue to turn a profit for their for their investment funds. Calpers and Calsters are some of the biggest funds in the country, and they're still saying, "Oh, you know, we lost money on South African tobacco." I'm not even sure that's accurate, but it didn't hurt the fund at all. Um, it means that sound financial planning. It means good analysis. It means a strategic approach to the markets should result in no losses and maybe even positive results from divestment. So when we talk to managers of funds like CalPERS and CalSTRS and even smaller ones, and I know there's some discussion at Fullerton around the, the, the Friends of Fullerton Fund, um, what we are saying, or what we are asking when we speak of, uh, of, uh, of divestment uh, to fossil fuels is not that you should get out. The real question for, for, um, for um, the, um, the uh, fund managers are, why are you in fossil fuels at all? And it's not a rhetorical question because they can't meet their own standards. What I've just outlined to you is a long train of losses, a small part of an investment portfolio, an industry with a negative outlook. And from a strictly financial perspective, as someone who manages a fund, why bother with them? Why bother at all? And it's this issue of a ne negative outlook. I wanna just spend a, a, a minute uh, to make a point on. Oil and gas companies know they are the primary source of greenhouse gas emissions. They know they must pivot away from this line of business. So far, the best of them have made commitments. Others like Exxon are just all talk and it's not true, whatever they say. The companies, however, continue to plan and spend like Antonia said, on new drilling and, and improving output of oil and gas in the hopes that the markets turn around. And they lobby hard against climate change solutions because those usually would result in a smaller amount of oil and gas being used in the world and their role being substantially reduced. Well, I was responsible for a large pension fund, actually two of them at an earlier part of my career, one million Workers and their families were responsible for the why we were we we were responsible for serving. Um, the oil and gas sector performed really well, and they were the most important contributor to the fund I managed. Um, this is no longer so. You cannot be romantic about business decisions. When an investment starts to fail, it's your responsibility to act. Divestment is a defensive financial move to protect funds from losses and the planet from future catastrophic current, um, future and, and current and future catastrophic, catastrophic events. Um, I also wanna take a few minutes now and step back a little bit because we have been soundly criticized by the fossil fuel industry. And I wanna to respond to a couple of things that they have said. Um, uh, Antonia touched on a number of them, but I just wanna develop it a little bit. Um, one critique is that divestment will have little impact until consumers use less fossil fuels. Um, no one denies that fossil fuels are part of everyday life, not only transportation, electricity, and home heating, but fossil fuels are also in plastics, and plastics are in our clothing, our computers, our carpets, our medical equipment, the bottles and cups that hold liquids we drink, the packages that bring food to our tables, the tables themselves, um, the plates and cookware, all either made principally of fossil fuels or preserved and protected by fossil fuel products. The divestment movement is part of the climate movement. And those of us in the climate movement are aware of the major economic transformation that is taking place as we speak. 
my organization a week or so ago came out with a study on wind and solar energy in the United States and showing it to be the fastest growing part of the energy sector. We're also watching as the auto industry around the world moves from internal combustion engines to electricity. Um, these are indications that the fossil fuel sector has, is seeing um, competition that they've never seen before historically, and it's part of the reason why you're seeing the drop in their profitability. What we have today are two economies. One of them I'll call a fossil fuel economy and one I'll call a green economy. They compete with each other every day. On the other hand, they cooperate and are the energy transition that you hear about. There's widespread job destruction, job and community destruction in the coal industry, for example. On the other hand, the green economy and energy is producing jobs and it's producing jobs not only in the energy sector, but beyond that. Um, but the, those changes in the rest of the economy that are going to need to take place as we and decarbonize the economy are opportunities for enormous amounts of investments and more jobs. We talk about divestment and investment for a reason. Um, divestment is, is designed as a defensive move for funds as these broader changes are taking place. It's in furtherance of economic changes away from fossil fuels and towards a broad array of alternatives which does also still include fossil fuels in the future, but in a much more limited uh, range of, act, uh, of, uh, of uh, functions in the economy. The debate over divestment is actually also a preparation of what needs to happen and what is happening. So do we need to change consumer habits? You bet. But the process is going to take place over time and it is not a logical reason for not divesting. We've experienced major technological changes in our lifetimes, you know, home phones to pay phones, to beepers and pages, to large cell phones, to pocket-sized cell phones, to who knows what's next. That's consumer behavior, technology, and markets all moving together. We can expect um, that, that that same series of, of uh, activities to wind its way through the economy with ever, ever new ways of organizing um, the economy from inputs from people all over the world. Um, and that's what we're looking at. Divestment in this sense is part and parcel of the very demand that those who are saying it'll only be when we change consumer demand because increasingly those who consume financial services are saying they don't wanna be in fossil fuels. And so the, that, that particular argument, it falls um, in terms of practical economics, it falls apart in terms of how technological change takes place and it has no basis in how actual um, financial change takes place. Another criticism is that divestment is a breach of what we call the fiduciary duty of a fund trustee. When you get on a board, you take on, you have an obligation and you have an obligation to use the assets of that fund to the benefit of the, of the people. If you're a university trustee, it's for the students and the faculty and the community so that it functions well. Like me, I was a pension fund manager. My, the, I was, I was uh, responsible for making sure that we pay the retirement checks for our retirees. Those were our beneficiaries. That's who I was responsible to. And you have a duty of care and prudence and it's called the fiduciary duty. And you have a responsibility um, to ensure that the actions that you take serve the beneficiaries. And a review of fossil fuel companies reveals several factors that fiduciaries must consider. First, are they making money and are they likely to make money in the future? Second, are they identifying and managing risks and is there a plan to manage risks? And third, given the philosophy, history and mission of a fund, where would divestment fit in? And looking at the first two uh, uh, questions about making money and identifying risk, the answer is no. 
um, per poor performance, financial performance by the industry, and the lack of preparation to address climate change is reason enough to meet the fiduciary test. Universities and many charitable organizations also have a higher bar. Um, they are obligated in almost every state in the country to consider the investment in relationship to the mission of their institution. That's state law in every single state, I believe every state. Right now, several student organizations that we're involved with have filed complaints with their attorneys general in their home state challenging university investments in fossil fuels on just this ground that runs counter to, this, to, the, to the intellectual traditions of our universities to be based in rational discussion, scientifically derived um, um, research and, and, uh, and sound uh, concern for the community and the ethical basis for our actions. And no university is going to want to stand before a, an attorney general and be subjected to, to those kinds of questions. But that is what holding fossil fuel means. It's you, it, should, it should be considered contrary to every university fund in the nation and every charitable organization that has investments. So divestment is not contrary to fiduciary duty. There are 1,500 examples of institutions around the country that have done one form or another have divested. The fiduciary argument being made by our opponents is completely wrong. And if you exercise good care and diligence in arriving at your decision, you run virtually no risk of being successfully challenged on that ground. And I was subjected to making fiduciary decisions for 17 years. I know a lot about it. Um, I want to take a few more of their arguments in rapid fire, step up the pace here because I'm almost done. And um, another argument they're being made is divestment has no effect, except every invest major investment house in the world now has what's called an ESG investment funds. And almost every one of them have exclusion lists that include fossil fuel companies. If we have had no uh, uh, impact, um, it's, it beats me how those, uh, for the, uh, these people now see business interests in, in, supporting, um, in supporting funds that are divesting because the public wants to see it and, and, and they're making money from it which is something to keep in mind. Um, they say also taking money away from companies, fossil fuel companies will only result in other investors buying the stock. Well, this chart that I'm showing you here, it shows you the opposite. And this is a fact. And uh, when you have a, a, an industry that has 28% of the stock market and now it's less than four, that's called less buying of the stock. So it isn't true that um, if, the, if, you, if funds like this, someone else will just buy them, they're not. Um, and if, it all, they are also saying to us, if you divest, it's gonna be very expensive I'm a, um, because there'll be fees and costs and this, you know, we're gonna not be able to fund the tuition and we're not gonna be able to fund uh, um, the pension funds where I am, except investment funds, the ones that I did, we bought and sold stock all the time. We have to, it's part of the process called rebalancing. And divestment, it's just another form of rebalancing, it shouldn't cost anything. Um, and, uh, and as more funds do it, any long-term maintenance can be spread across all the funds and there's really no impact at all. Um, but you'll hear that and it just isn't factually correct. Um, that it's a, it's a, a uh, misinformation, let's call it. And then they say funds will lose access to important money managers because the money managers are so responsible that they will boycott the, fund, the investment funds who want to divest. Um, when New York City put out a bid to see if they could divest, BlackRock and several other major investment firms competed for the business because they wanted the contract. And that's it. right now, divestment and ESG is a cottage industry within the money, within the money advisory world. And they are competing for the work um, to do it when funds ask them to do it. Um, and so that too isn't, I could go on on these um, because I deal with this almost every day, um, but I should return a little bit to the trends uh, that are going on and then I'll wrap up. Um, capital markets, despite what I'm talking to you about, are moving too slowly to deal with climate change. Um, the slow movement 
a way um, gives us some hope. Um, and as a sense, in one sense, the market is empowering the divestment movement. And on the other hand, the divestment movement is trying to empower the companies to support the people in those companies who are willing to um, um, you know, push um, for fossil free portfolios and um, to diminish investment capital going into the fossil free sector. The question is becomes like, why does this matter? And I'll finish up with that. Um, at the state level here in California, um, where, where CalPERS and CalSTRS um, are pension funds, they're a very important part of your budget process. And, you, and when the pension funds flounder, taxes go up and um, tough budget decisions need to get made. And we know that when tough budget decisions get made, higher education, healthcare, and rebuilding of the communities that don't have a lot of political muscle, um, low income um, and, um, uh, and uh, minority communities do not benefit in a situation like that. Um, so when, when they are, um, the, um, their, their, their decisions by CalPERS have very important budgetary implications. It's also important at the county level where I know community colleges get a lot of their money, shrinking state um, but, uh, budgets and weaker tax bases and are um, detrimental um, to county budgets and to the kind of services that people rely upon. Um, you don't want this kind of um, um, a mess in your investment portfolios over time. You need to be able to get smooth, steady profits in order to keep that connection between the investment funds and our public dollars um, strong. Um, similarly, philanthropic investments used to support all kinds of activities, including higher ed, can't support students with tuition and capital programs for good buildings and up-to-date technology if they don't have the money. So the financial case I'm trying to make here uh, for divestment is financially compelling. And I'll leave you with just a couple of thoughts about divestment and leadership. For the students, divestment campaigns are taking place all over the country. If you're interested to learn more, you can check out divestharvard.com or divestinvest.org. Um, you can become involved. Your, um, your concern and your voice matters. And actually it means everything. Last night at that hearing, it was the students and other um, California residents that carried that vote because those legislators saw that there were hundreds of people who went to some obscure um, committee, you know, tucked away in Sacramento, the Senate Judiciary Committee, and they showed up and they spoke out. And that was very important because the opposition was there and we outnumbered them. And that's what needs to be done. For the administrators who may be um, on this, um, listening to this, I was a public official. And what I signed up for was not what I got. And all of you know what that means. All of you know what it is to have to make choices based on poor information, a handful of difficult choices with lousy expected outcomes. It's kind of what you get when you get into public office. Um, but climate is a different, is a difficult issue. It's unfair to the um, uh, academics and the academic community to have to make climate policy with their fiduciary powers. You may not be wanting to do it, you may not be interested in it, but it is interested in you and what you want is not what is needed. As university officials, you have an extra special challenge. The students are watching, they can tell leaders who act, act out of fear, arrogance and selfishness, and they can also be inspired by leadership that is kind, resourceful and humble. And I've seen this happen over and over again. Climate change and divestment touches all aspects of university life. The intellectual inquiry, ethical action, interest group conflict, as well as the mundane world of budgets, administration, and finance. Divestment, as with leadership, is an all things considered judgment. Um, finally, when I was sitting on the lawn at City Hall that Earth Day, I spoke about before, there was a musician who played a song. His name was Richie Havens. 
And the song was, What You Gonna Do About Me? It's still worth a listen for everybody today. Thanks. Oh. All right, thank you, Tom. Um, so I think we can go ahead and uh, address some of the questions that people have put in the q and I believe Antonio has, has started to type some of them in. Um, but Ruben, do you have anything specific that you would like to ask uh, either of the panelists? Not necessarily. I think we have some good questions in the Q&A that uh, our, our students and other members of the community should have at least addressed a little bit here. Um, so one of the common things I'm seeing in the Q&A um, are uh, kind of have to do with the alternative energy sector. Um, and so, Antonio, if you wouldn't mind starting, could you give us a couple of examples of how, because uh, you mentioned um, how local communities uh, produce and distribute their own energy um, locally. Um, so can you give us maybe an example or two of what you've seen um, as, for, as far as those alternatives go? Yeah, and I guess to thank you to put it in the, and first, thank you, Tom, for that great um, presentation and the extremely kind words uh, at the beginning. I really appreciate it. And Tom, of course, has been a source on my stories and his work uh, is fantastic. So it was a real treat to hear that um, presentation. Um, so just uh, what I would say is one example um, here in New Orleans, where I am, uh, there's a big push towards community owned solar projects where that is you have um, a localized solar farm that's either um, on land nearby or placed on people's homes and houses. Um, that energy is owned and supported by that local community and the energy um, provide and, the, and it provides energy for the local community. And then anything that's excess goes back onto the grid. And this has been really important in New Orleans um, because when there are hurricanes and storms, the large centralized systems of energy get shut off and shut down. And if everything is centralized in one, in one area and the spokes that connect it out to the grid are shut down, then we are all shut off from energy, which we were in the, in the wake of Hurricane Ida um, in some examples for weeks and others um, for months. Um, but the localized system of energy isn't uh, harmed in the same way. It doesn't have the same tentacles that can be broken down and shut down. It's right there. And those communities continue to have their energy source. Moreover, actually, solar panels on roofs were found to protect roofs from storm damage. Um, and what this means by localizing the energy source, because one of the questions was really important, it asked, do we have enough, can renewable energy produce enough to replace fossil fuels? And what's really interesting is that um, Fossil fuels now cost as much to produce as they did 150 years ago. The industry has not put more money into making itself more efficient. They've put more money into finding more, ever more expensive forms of, of energy. So they've gone to the deepest depths of the ocean, into the tar sands, into shale rock, and that's where their money has gone. Renewable energy instead has gotten five times, uh, many more times than that, more efficient and more cost effective. So it's cheaper to consume uh, each year. And also when you use those localized forms of energy, the energy doesn't have to move as far. So you use less of it because it doesn't have to, uh, to you don't have to also have that energy to move uh, the energy to different locations. So basically you need less energy when you replace fossil fuels with renewables. So it doesn't need to be a one-to-one -one. and you save money by shifting to the renewables because they're so much more uh, e efficient um, and effective. Yeah, we've, we're involved in, uh, in Puerto Rico and I've been for about 10 years. Um, and uh, and um, uh, they went bankrupt as and had all the storms um, and they have to rebuild their energy grid. And the fossil fuel interests now, um, it's uh, just like 2% of uh, the energy system in Puerto Rico is, uh, is, a, is renewable energy. The rest of it is diesel oil, coal, and some natural gas. And um, it costs about two and a half billion dollars a year to pay for those uh, fossil fuels. And the uh, energy industry is down there and they don't want to give up a nickel of it. 
Um, and so we've been able through organizing and uh, kind of expertise that we do to have the regulators say that we need, we absolutely have to have solar, more solar energy in massive amounts to deal with the reliability issues that Antonio was just talking about. And they're also in bankruptcy. So my job has been to deal with the financial aspects of this. They can't balance their budget unless they do renewable energy. It's that much right now, the, um, the price of electricity in Puerto Rico is between 25 and 30 cents a kilowatt hour. We can bring renewable energy into Puerto Rico for nine cents a kilowatt hour. That's one third the price. The politics of it is we're getting beaten at every step and we just keep doing it and we just keep fighting it. And I don't know where it's gonna go. We're, not gonna, we're never gonna give up. The people there are just not gonna give up. Um, and, uh, but the, neither is the industry. I don't know what the ultimate outcome is. Um, between that and the Wall Street interests who are trying to wreck the bankruptcy plan so that the economy can work there, um, it's, a, it's a fight. And we do that battle in uh, other places in the world, in Indonesia, we've done it, um, the Philippines, same, it's almost the same battle. Um, to get, to get rid of the fossil fuel interest. And as I said before, they don't have a financial rationale. They, they, they have a political rationale. Um, and, uh, and, and we just, and um, we have the financial rationale. Um, yeah, and just add, sorry, Tom, really quick to, to jump on what you just said. And also in response to some of the questions, you know, one of, one of the, um, what I hear over and over again in local communities is um, not that, is that they have the ability to implement these solutions, but they don't have the resources. They don't get the same attention. And when we're talking about divestment and reinvestment, there's trillions of dollars circulating, uh, investing in fossil fuels. And there is just a trickle, almost nothing that goes to support these local um, sustainable community solutions all over the world. I was just, just had a presentation yesterday in my class from Amira Woods, um, the Institute for Policy Studies, who's an expert on, on Africa. She's from Liberia. And she just said, there's example after example of exa example across the African continent, across Latin America, across the United States of local communities that want to implement uh, you know, simple rooftop solar in their, in their communities, particularly rural communities. But the money that's going to finance even renewable energy is going towards large scale, uh, technologically extremely complex, massive scale operations that haven't gotten off the ground because they're too expensive, too remote, too distant, when money could just go right now immediately to support uh, the local communities. And so it's not, so what we're, we're talking about here isn't just divestment, it's where can that money be redirected to immediately benefit communities, um, but also, as Tom is saying, um, is a better um, return on investment in the end uh, anyway. Yeah, it sounds like, um, I don't know if this is a good characterization of what's happening, but like the democratization of energy um, at these local levels uh, seems to be like a really good way forward because a lot of people think that, you know, these upfront costs um, are expensive for individuals, but if they're shared by the community, that seems like a much more efficient way, not just energy wise, but financially as well. Um, so it makes sense that, that that is a path forward. Yeah, we did a thing in New York State. Um, we were asked to design a program that would allow for mass expansion of rooftop solar for homeowners and tenants in the state. And we designed it and then we figured out a way to finance it um, so that there was a sliding scale that the poorest people didn't have to pay um, uh, a, a lot, if anything. And then to the more middle income people where there would be a more of a lending traditional kind of banking relationship, um, it works. Um, the mechanisms are there. We're gonna to try to do the same kind of thing in. Uh, you know, in Puerto Rico, and there are other places besides New York that are doing the same thing. You can do it at a mass scale, um, and uh, and it can be done. And with and I, <laughs> I won't go into it, but there are ways to do this between the federal government, the state government, and the business community. And you do you do these trade offs is what they are, and it's better that than subsidizing the fossil fuel sector. 
And, um, and, and when you can build businesses, you're going to be building local businesses who are going to be um, bringing in the, the panels and bringing in um, the, um, the kind of energy efficiency things. In, in New York, we've created a couple of labor centers. The labor unions really didn't want these um, kinds of projects because they're too tiny. Um, but the communities did. And so there are little labor centers that the business community started and they're mostly run by women and, and, uh, and uh, an African-American and Puerto Rican and Chicano in, in New York, all over the state, they're there. I mean, they're small, the program isn't as well funded as it should be, but it could be, and uh, this stuff can work and it's gonna create way economic, it's an economic change that is, looks positive in almost every way and we need to adopt more of it and, and we have answers we have answers the bigger systems those electrical systems in some places you need them um, um, but you only need them after you've exhausted the lowest most, least costly one uh, well um, investment which is the rooftop solar that's your cheapest form of investment um, and once you maximize that, you may need big, bigger systems for hospitals, for, um, you know, whatever you, if you have a baseball stadiums and things like that, you may need larger systems, um, uh, but, you know, industrial uh, facilities, but even those don't have to be fossil fuel. I mean, uh, Exxon is now buying solar energy, incidentally, to run their refineries in Texas. I thought that was quite amusing. Well, thank you everybody for attending our symposium. We are out of time. Really quickly before we end our session, uh, we will, well, we did record the session and we will make the link to this video conference available uh, later on. Um, so please keep an eye out for um, an announcement from Fulton College. Uh, also, uh, if our panelists are agreeable to it, um, we can also, as part of that email post, uh, contact information if you are willing to answer maybe some of the questions that we did not get a chance to answer as our time ran out today. Um, just want to say thank you very much to both and uh, Antonia and Tom for sharing their expertise and their valuable time with us today. Um, this will conclude our session for today. Thank you very much for attending.